Today on Studio One, we'll tell you how the color and style of police uniforms plays a role in public perception. Also, a new workout routine is catching on. Find out exactly what CrossFit means. And we'll introduce you to a woman who took a childhood hobby and turned it into profit. From the University of North Dakota, this is Studio One, celebrating 25 years. Hi everyone and welcome to Studio One. I'm Monty Cashel. And I'm Ann Hook. Well, we're receiving a lot of news attention on the oil boom no in North Dakota yes, recently. Yes, yes, the Bakken, mm -hmm. it's called. But we don't really get to hear a lot of attention, especially life within the cities, especially where people are staying and yeah. where they are housing. And that's the key word, people. So many mm -hmm. people, a population boom has happened because of all these workers coming mm -hmm. to the oil patch and, and certainly not enough housing out there. Mm -hmm. But one interesting thing is we don't know what life is like inside those camps. So today on the show, we're going to be having an archaeologist. And he is going to actually come and talk about his research is revolving about how these workers are making these camps a home. All right. Sounds interesting. Also on the show, people's perception about police officers can depend on their uniform. We'll tell you why some police departments are changing their style. And some diseases are easily forgotten. Later, we will meet a team that is fighting a recent outbreak of tuberculosis. But first, here's today's news with Ali Strand. Thanks, Monty and Anne. Tens of thousands of Venezuelans gathered to pay their respects to the nation's president, Hugo Chavez. The country's leader died Wednesday after a massive heart attack. A state funeral is arranged for the former president in the Venezuelan capital on Friday. Other world leaders attending the funeral are the presidents of Argentina and Iran. During this time as Venezuela's leader, Chavez gained a national following for his socialist revolution. Though never officially disclosed, Chavez had been battling cancer for two years. He was 58 years old. Arkansas has passed the toughest abortion law in the U.S. The Human Heartbeat Protection Act restricts abortion after 12 weeks of pregnancy. This is typically when the heartbeat of the fetus can be detected through ultrasound. Opponents of the bill are calling it unconstitutional. Some anti-abortion groups say it will most likely be overridden in federal court. Many babies are learning a new language at just six months old, sign language. Studies from the National Institutes of Health show children are picking it up more quickly than speech. Parents can teach their children simple words like more, please, and thank you. Not only can children mentally learn the signs easier than speech, but the motor control of hands and fingers develop quicker than muscle groups used for talking. But if you think about just overall motor control, it's a whole lot easier to, to develop gross motor control, which is what you would need for the sign of more or thank you, than it is for the fine motor control that is required for speech production. Research has found that sign language reduces frustration and boosts children's self-esteem. Experts say signing can also help with language development later in life. The FDA has recently approved the first bionic eye. Developed by the Second Sight Medical, the eye detects light and dark. It is meant to help those affected by a rare type of blindness. This genetic condition affects 1 in 4,000 people in the U.S. The invention is already available in Europe and seven hospitals in the United States. In the future, the developers say it may also be used to treat eye conditions such as macular degeneration. Police departments across North America are changing their wardrobe. Earlier this week, the officers in Montreal, Quebec, traded in their baby blue shirts for a midnight navy. Meanwhile, Santa Fe wants to do the opposite, saying lighter colored uniforms result in fewer complaints about police. But what may seem like a minor color preference can make a big difference. When this is heard, it's safe to say we know who's coming. They're absolutely aware, yeah. But the red and blue flashes are not the only signal that makes people aware. You're identified with the uniform as, as a presence as you show up. Uh, you know, there you have the presence of, I don't want to say a calming matter, but here's the authority. Whereas if you show up out of uniform, it's like, nah, here's another guy. The discussion of whether the color of the uniform has an effect is a debated topic. Psychological research suggests that through social learning, people have developed stigmas assigned to certain uniform colors. Lighter colored police shirts increase officer approachability, where a darker color uniform makes officers appear more aggressive. But some experts say color doesn't even matter. Again, I don't know how much the color will have an impact here and whatnot, and all the changing of the uniforms, but uh, 
the uniform itself will have an impact on how we view those individuals and how they are perceived. Lieutenant Maxson understands that his job doesn't always allow the biggest fan base, but he gears up knowing he is there to protect and serve. You know, the perception of being bad is because sometimes people see us at their worst points in their life. And, you know, unfortunately, we chose a career where we're not allowed to make everybody happy all the time. Hi. The job of a police officer still remains the same, not because the color they wear on their back, but the badge they wear on their front. Along with the uniform, the type of hat police officers wear also attributes to the influence of an officer. The traditional bus driver garrison cap and the Smokey Bear campaign hat were found to convey more authority than the baseball cap or no cap at all. And that's the news for now. Monty Nan. Thanks a lot, Allie. Well, it's, it's interesting how pretty much everybody knows what mm -hmm. you're talking about when they describe the Smokey the Bear hat. Mm -hmm. It's really easy to be spotted in a crowd. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to hear more from Kellen Peters in the weather studio about a big storm that just hit the Midwest. All right, Kellen. Thanks, Anna Monty. Yeah, it's pretty hard to miss when it's taken up over half the United States. And we do have some snow totals for you that exactly the areas that have been hit. First turn out, going out to Grand Forks, North Dakota. Now, out at the airport, they recorded over nine inches of snow. Uh, throughout the area now, but just going down 350 miles to the southeast. Same story happened down in the Minneapolis area, still 9.3 inches. Other areas that were affected, Chicago, now they got 9.2 inches, which may not seem like a whole lot for some areas, but this was record breaking. They have never had this much snowfall total accumulate from just one single storm. Now, obviously, with the city of Chicago, they have two major airports. It created quite an issue for a lot of travelers and across the nation, just itself, this storm created over a thousand uh, cancellations of flights. Now the storm did take some track and did move out to our nation's capital, Washington DC. They got three inches of snow out there too. So the storm was very big and it created over 250,000 homes and businesses without power. Now we do have some satellite and imagery for you, just showing the track of the storm, just exactly what happened. You can see it really started over and you got North Dakota and Minnesota, some thick clouds and a lot of uh, where the snow started to fall right across this area and moved down in towards Chicago. But if you keep an eye on this whip down here, just kind of whipping across the southeastern, this is thunderstorms that was happening down in Georgia. We will be talking about that a little bit later in the show. The storm did continue to shift track and move up the east coast and you can see bringing a lot of moisture on the backside and then parts of Massachusetts got over two feet of snow. So it's a very powerful storm that did happen. And we do have a temperature outlook uh, for you over the next two weeks. You can see that a large chunk of it's gonna be a uh, colder than average conditions. Hopefully if you're going on spring break, you're traveling down to Miami, should be normal conditions for this time of the year. Or if you move into the southwestern part of the United States, maybe out in Arizona, could be warmer than average temperatures. Seeing your precipitation at all, it's covering a large chunk all the way from the Pacific Northwest and moving across the border down the south, uh, southeastern part of the United States. And we do have a story about going on the ice and safety with that a little bit later in the show, which brings us to our weather question of the week, is how many inches thick should the ice be in order to walk out on it? With our answers ranging anywhere from four to 10 inches. So if you're an, an avid ice fisher or a snowmobile, uh, snowmobiler, you might want to stick around with the story coming up a little bit later in the show. All right, thanks, Kellen. Thank you. Yeah, it is really important to know how much ice is mm -hmm. out there before you venture out, that's for sure. Yeah, don't want to fall through. No. All right, well, let's turn to Brian Gendro now with some sports highlights. Thanks, Monty and Ann. Jocks are normally associated with intelligence, but research has shown the brain is bulking up. Being a successful athlete comes down to more than just being bigger, stronger, and faster. A new study published by Scientific Reports shows athletes have stronger mental abilities than non-athletes. Athletes excel in cognitive areas such as working memory, creativity, and multitasking. To all the amateurs out there, no need to worry. These skills can all be learned. I don't think anybody's born with uh, hand-eye coordination more so than another. I think everybody starts with a clean slate. Increased hand-eye coordination is one of the many additions to, the, to a player's skill set. The study also shows that years of experience and intensity of sports are two major factors in acquiring these skills. It's now time for the Studio One Sports Trivia Question. Who was the first professional athlete to get paid to endorse a product? Your choices are Joe DiMaggio, Michael Jordan, Babe Ruth, and Honus Wagner. And the answer to that question will be coming up later in the show. That's the sports for now. 
Monty and Ann. Thanks a lot, Brian. Disney's newest film has a small-town circus magician swept away from dreary Kansas. James Franco plays a man who is called to join the forces of good to defeat evil in the movie Oz the Great and Powerful. We'll preview that film. Also, in the past, tuberculosis affected many people. Next, we will meet two men who are helping the community to stop present-day outbreaks. Life is busy, but many professionals are finding ways to advance their career with a Master's in Business Administration at the University of North Dakota. Students attend UND online and on campus. The program is nationally recognized and emphasizes one-on-one -on -one with faculty. Find the title you deserve. Enroll today. At the University of North Dakota College of Engineering and Mines, classes have real-life application. Mentors guide students. Our work improves quality of life by answering tough questions with creativity and innovation. The University of North Dakota College of Engineering and Mines, training tomorrow's engineering and geology experts today. does cancer look like? What about diabetes, heart disease? Medical laboratory professionals are a vital link in the treatment of disease and maintenance of health. They investigate clues found in the body that will direct patient care. The University of North Dakota's laboratory science programs are some of the most innovative, far-reaching, fully accredited programs in the nation. The UND School of Medicine and Health Sciences can help you become one of the few who see beneath the surface. This scene is familiar, but you and your friends are at risk. One in three Americans will die from heart disease or stroke. Think about it. One in three. Every day, more than 2,000 Americans die from cardiovascular disease. The Million Hearts Initiative works to prevent one million heart attacks and strokes. Understand the risks, get active, and reduce sodium and trans fats in your diet. It's a silent killer, but now is the time to take control of your health. Learn more about making a heart-healthy future. Awarded the Overall Excellence in Cable TV by the Northwest Broadcast News Association, this is Studio One. Tuberculosis was first recognized in the 1850s and still continues to be prevalent in our society. Grand Forks, North Dakota has seen a recent increase in the disease. Public health experts Don Shields and Raymond Goldstein are part of a team that is fighting the outbreak from spreading. Thanks for coming on the show today. It's great to be here. Well, first of all, uh, Don, I want to start with you. What is tuberculosis? Tuberculosis is an airborne disease, but it's a very fragile disease, and it's something that, although it's airborne, such as flus and colds, you can't get it like that. It's very fragile. It takes close contact over a long period of time to come down with tuberculosis. Well, how does it transfer then? You say it's airborne but fragile. So what is an instance where? You, uh, in order for it to transfer, we have to have very close contact, from an infectious person over a long length of time. So we'd have to sit here at the table. It's not something that we can get at a mall, uh, from a glass or a movie or a restaurant. So we'd have to be here singing, talking, in this type of close environment for a long period of time. Okay, what about diagnosis? How, how do you diagnose someone with tuberculosis? Uh, diagnosis is a little more complex because uh, the difficulty with some of the tests and the long lead time to culture out those tests. But uh, basically some of the symptoms of TB is things such as a fever and a bloody cough for more than three weeks. So those are some of the signs and symptoms you and I would recognize. Doctors then would take like a chest x-ray, CAT scan, uh, do some blood testing, and do some cultures. Okay, and there has been a recent increase in the Grand Forks community. Um, how many more cases have you seen and, and why did this happen? 
In October, we identified our first cluster of three cases. Since then, we've identified 16 active cases, and we've tested over 900 people who are contacts, close contacts, of those 16 cases. Okay. Raymond, I'd like to ask you now, um, when does something like this become an epidemic? Um, the best way to say it is when you ha it, it's contagious and it spreads to its, its, a population um, and it spreads to other areas. And then, so you're worried about the, um, the ability of it to, to transmit and, and what would you add to that, Don? I think that's exactly right and, and it depends too upon the how many cases of tuberculosis you have going on. Grand Forks in North Dakota is a very low incident state. So we may see one or two cases a year, but having 16 cases in Grand Forks in a very short period of time makes an epidemic. If we were beyond two cases, we generally go into that time. So it's exactly what Dr. Goldstein said. And there's some numbers that go along with that. Sure. And, and Raymond, how, how does uh, public health respond to things like this? I mean, uh, you know, how do you plan to tackle something like this? Well, surveillance. <laughs> Keep ready. Expect it. Um, somehow, for many of us, we forgot this disease. It's kind of like, you know, something of the past, something that our grandparents had, something that won't affect us today. We're, and especially in North Dakota, you don't think of it. You think of it maybe in New York City or or urbanized areas, poverty areas. Well, the world's quite different. Yes, you do associate it with poverty. You do associate it with close quarters and, and, and problems of, of poverty. But as you can see in the Grand Forks, it, it can jump from people with certain risk factors to people who are more affluent and um, you would not expect them to have it, but like in a school. So children from all different backgrounds then are exposed to it and are at risk for it. Uh, so our job is to have a public health response expecting this, or it could be something else, sure. but some, expecting this to happen, be ready to respond. This is a classic, uh, which I think Don's going to be too modest about it, but a classic way to deal with public health uh, risk like this. Sure. His group mobilized quickly with the partnership of the medical center here, and uh, CDC in Atlanta and, and as well as um, the State Health Department were able to work together, bring the tools out there to basically not only detect, but you know, to, to basically do investigations and then control this type of thing from getting any worse. So you so bring other people in to absolutely. help out as well. And this shows a system working. Sure. It, it shows a system mobilizing and working in which we could not do by ourselves. Right. Um, and just the classic ways, you know, like before we had all this in place, we were at much a, a greater risk. If we didn't have this team, this excellent team in place, this could have spread much farther. Sure. Don, how do you protect yourself from TB? You know, the thing about tuberculosis, it's a very slow growing disease. And so one of the things that you do is you can certainly cover your mouth when you cough and those types of things. But you really have to have a very close exposure from a very infectious person for a long length of time. Our cluster here has really been in a segment that's homeless. Mm. There are people that may be staying in a tent in a backyard or with friends. They go in, they don't necessarily have a residence, so they're invited in a home. So uh, the, the everyday person that goes to the mall or go grocery store <coughs> shouldn't have to worry about that. But if you've had close contact, we would be calling you and saying, please come in and get tested. Okay, now this happened, you responded. How do you know, looking at, at how you responded to this, whether it was successful or not? Well, the epidemic is still going on. The outbreak is still going on and I would expect over the next several months to announce additional cases. Whenever you have 16 cases in a community like ours uh, that you've had so many exposures that uh, we will probably have additional active cases. Okay. Really quickly, Raymond, for you, in terms of public health, how do you know when you've successfully done your job with something like this? Well, you know that, that, that the, the rate of spreading has gone down. You know that. You know that the people who are, uh, have been detected are under treatment. So now you have all the tools in place. You're still doing your surveillance. You don't expect, as, as, uh, as was stated, that this is going to go away 
that quickly, but you know that everything's in place to monitor and see if it stops spreading or, or you know, basically things are under control. Sure. I think I think what what we learned here is the value of public health. Yes. Uh, that the help of organized public health can protect your community. And thank goodness people like you are looking out for others. So yeah. thank you so much right. for coming on the show today and sharing this with us. It's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Coming up, more than 100,000 athletes are registered for this year's CrossFit Games Open. They hope to make it to the national stage to compete this summer. We'll tell you exactly what this workout craze is all about. Also, internet shopping is becoming more popular each year. We'll show you how one woman's business is thriving in the online world. Studio One closed captioning is underwritten in part by Options, your disability information source. It's not the size of the woman in the fight. It's the size of the fight in the woman. My doctor tells me to play outside every day. I see a physician assistant in my rural clinic. I'm glad that she's here. But health care is changing. Rural North Dakota communities face workforce shortages, particularly in primary care. The University of North Dakota School of Medicine and Health Sciences addresses the state's health care needs by educating the next generation of health care professionals. We advocate for improved health in rural communities. Your future depends on this moment. Take the path that leads to your future. The University of North Dakota is a place where students thrive, where personal connections matter, where classmates become friends, where leading scholars become mentors. Experience our expertise. Creative, innovative, entrepreneurial, spirited. This is the University of North Dakota. The Land of Oz is making another appearance in Hollywood. It is reintroduced through the new film Oz the Great and Powerful. James Franco stars in the new movie. Franco's character enters the land of Oz where anything seems possible. There, many wonder if he was the great wizard sent there to save them. A lot like the original Oz, he follows the yellow brick road to friends. He is forced to choose between good and evil as three witches question his credibility. In the land of Oz, um, he gets to relive everything he went through on Earth, or he has sort of a second chance to do things over. Golden Globe nominee Mila Kunis also stars in the film, alongside two-time Oscar nominee Rachel Weisz. The movie opens in theaters March 8th. Now it's time to look at the events happening in your area. has become more popular throughout the years. One woman's creations have made a statement in the online world. Well, these are the two Miss Maddies, where they can be, you can change their hair, their eyes. Sewing has been one of Shannon's hobbies since she was little. After creating baby products for her nieces and nephews, her sisters encouraged her to start her own online business. Etsy is 
a place where you can find anything handmade or vintage. Um, so it's kind of like the handmade store, like eBay. Red's attic is named after her own nickname, Red, and her love for playing in attics as a child. Her business is found on Etsy.com and located in stores throughout the state of North Dakota. Our customers really like homemade stuff, unique stuff, and her quality was exceptional. Most of Shannon's sales come from local events like Pride of Dakota shows. However, online, Red's Attic was ranked number five in the top 50 Etsy shops. I really couldn't believe it. I was so excited that I was number five um, because some of those sh shops that were in there, um, I had wanted to be like them. So for me to be a part of that was amazing. Shannon's treasures not only provide fun for children, but are also meaningful for adults. One woman had a doll made after losing her baby at birth. That's the remembrance of their little angel. So knowing that I'm making those kind of treasures for people is, is the most rewarding thing. Shannon personally hand stitches something on each item to make every one of her creations special. I want to make sure that there's, there's love that goes with everything that I make. So her needle pulling thread brings joy and men's hearts one stitch at a time. I'm Stephanie Shire reporting for Studio One. Every one of Shannon's plush creations is named after someone in her family. Her popular Miss Maddie doll is named after her 11 year old niece. Coming up, March is usually the month when green begins to peek through the snow and the melt is on its way. Find out safety tips for being on the ice this time of year. That story plus news, sports and weather in the next half hour of Studio One. Closed captioning for Studio One is underwritten in part by NDAD. Helping others to help themselves. At the University of North Dakota College of Engineering and Mines, classes have real-life application. Mentors guide students. Our work improves quality of life by answering tough questions with creativity and innovation. The University of North Dakota College of Engineering and Mines, training tomorrow's engineering and geology experts today. Life is busy, but many professionals are finding ways to advance their career with a Master's in Business Administration at the University of North Dakota. Students attend UND online and on campus. The program is nationally recognized and emphasizes one-on-one -on -one with faculty. Find the title you deserve. Enroll today. What does cancer look like? What about diabetes, heart disease? Medical laboratory professionals are a vital link in the treatment of disease and maintenance of health. They investigate clues found in the body that will direct patient care. The University of North Dakota's laboratory science programs are some of the most innovative, far-reaching, fully accredited programs in the nation. The UND School of Medicine and Health Sciences can help you become one of the few who see beneath the surface. From the University of North Dakota, celebrating 25 years, this is Studio One. Welcome back to Studio One. Thanks for joining us today. Well, in terms of flu seasons, this has mm -hmm. been a bad one. A lot yeah. of people coming down uh, with the flu. I've gotten like twice already. I know, a lot of people have. And a lot of people get flu shots. A lot of people don't get flu shots. Mm -hmm. There seems to be this, you know, uh, either or kind of a situation with people. And the CDC recently sent out a report saying, People over 65 were only protected 9%. It was 9% effective, the, the flu, current flu shot, 
for those uh, people. And so we went out and we asked people, did you get the flu, flu shot? Yes or no? Mm -hmm. Why or why not? And their answers are coming up in the next 30 minutes. Also on Studio One, the buzz around gun bans has caused many to flock to gun shows. Find out how much sales have gone up and why it could be a problem. Also, deer hunting is a popular hobby or even lifestyle for some. We'll show you one man who has taken his love for deer to monstrous proportions. And archaeologists are often viewed as people who dig up relics of the past. Later, we'll talk to a man who researched present-day worker camps in the North Dakota oil patch. But first, here's today's news with Ali Strand. Thanks, Monty and Ann. North Korea is threatening to launch a preemptive nuclear attack against the U.S. They are accusing America of pushing to start a war. The United Nations Security Council placed new sanctions on North Korea over its latest nuclear test. The resolution clamps down on cash transfers, illicit cargo vessels, and aviation. A South Korea spokesperson says they are also watching the North's activities and are readying forces. It appears to be the most specific open threat of a nuclear strike yet. A lion attacked and killed a 24-year-old woman on Wednesday afternoon. The victim, Deanna Hansen, had been interning at the Wild Animal Park for two months. When authorities arrived, they followed protocol and fatally shot Couscous, the four-year-old lion. Her father says she loved to be around big cats. Working with them was her true passion in life. He also says she was aware that only the owners were allowed inside the cage. It is unknown what Hansen was doing inside the cage or what prompted the attack. Turning 16 has always been a big year. As more teenagers, teenage drivers hit the road for the first time, a rising statistic has taken the spotlight. A new report published by the Governor's Highway Safety Association shows teenage driving deaths jumped 19% in the first half of 2012. Just over 200 teenage driving deaths were reported altogether. This marks a major increase compared to previous years. Distractions behind the wheel tend to be the problem. I think anytime you have young people driving and they don't have the experience and they're the ones that are probably hooked up to their uh, iPhones and their, their cell phones and their texting and, and they're just more social beings so it's very hard for them to stay focused on the road. Some experts speculate that the rise in driving deaths show signs of a rebounding economy. The teens have more disposable incomes for gas and attending activities. Welfare programs are in the doghouse. A pet-based organization helps provide food stamps for lower-income families with pets. Pet Food Stamps is based out of New York and is open to anyone in the United States. The only way to apply to the program is online. In order to receive pet food each month, families first need their income verified in order to get a six-month supply of pet food. More than 45,000 pets have already been signed up in the past two weeks. The December school shooting in Newtown, Connecticut has triggered a response in Washington. While some lawmakers are calling for a ban on military-style weaponry, the proposal is raising more than just eyebrows. In a time when many are tightening up their purse strings, these people are dishing out the big bucks. This is one of an estimated 5,200 gun shows held each year nationwide. And with the potential gun ban approaching, enthusiasts across the nation are rushing to stock up their arsenals. Anything that is termed with a semi-automatic uh, weapon is, has been flying off the shelves for oh, about a month and a half, maybe two months now. Industry reports show that gun ownership in the U.S. is at an all-time high, with more than 100 million firearm owners. A record 2.2 million background checks were done in December for gun purchases. This is a 58.6% increase over the same period in 2011. We've noticed a big, big boom in our, in our uh, business. People are constantly calling saying, you know, they want to get their permits and asking what can they do to make sure that their rights are secured. Assault rifles and semi-automatic handguns, which once made up 40% of total gun sales, now comprise about 75%. High-capacity magazines are also facing a ban or restriction. They're selling at highly inflated prices, some as much as five times the normal rate. They are scared, so they're just trying to buy. I think what they're doing is buying as much stuff as they can before it becomes uh, illegal to buy them. 
With the increased demand, dealers are struggling to keep up their supply. Some sellers are reporting three to six month back orders. And with Capitol Hill's decision pending, cautious spenders are biting the bullet to beat the deadline. This is Olivia Fox reporting for Studio One. The increase in gun sales has caused an increase in ammunition. Gun shops and sporting goods stores across the U.S. have been running short on ammo. Many stores don't expect to see their stocks getting back to normal until summer. And that's the news. Monty and Ann. Thanks a lot, Allie. It certainly is something when, uh, you know, the White House starts talking about putting bans on anything. Mm -hmm. The price of, them, of uh, the items always goes up. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I think we're going to hear more from Kellen Peters in the weather studio about some severe weather hitting Georgia. Thanks, Ann and Monty. Yeah, well, a large part of the United States were cleaning up after snowfalls. Uh, Georgia was seeing something a little bit different for this time of the year or compared to everyone else. Yeah, they had uh, thunderstorms sweeping through the area last Tuesday. They had strong winds that was able to bring trees down. City officials said that in Gordon County that there were several reports of damaged homes in the area. Now, thankfully, there were no injuries. Now, after the storm did pass, though, the high for the day was only 47 degrees, but the National Weather Service put out wind advisories for the area. Now, when you think of wind damage, you might think of tornadoes causing it. This wasn't the case here. They are caused by microbursts. And here we have a diagram showing what exactly these microbursts are. So in the when a thunderstorm's in its prime stage, you have strong updraft, strong updrafts and strong downdrafts. And these are basically motions of moving air. Now, as the storm starts maturing, the, the updrafts really deplete. It's really the downdrafts that are coming down. Now, just like flowing water through a pipe, the smaller diameter you're going to have, the stronger flow you're going to have. So these winds are just pushing towards the earth. Now, if you take a bottle and you throw it to the ground, obviously it's going to spread out. It's the same case with these winds. Now, these winds hit the ground and spread out within a radius. These winds can get up to 150 miles an hour, so just like tornado wind speeds and create straight line wind damage. So it could be, it can be very confusing to tell the difference when you're seeing this much wind occurring. Now, for other parts of the United States that are still seeing uh, colder temperatures, that could mean you want to go out on the ice, but just make sure you check the conditions just before you take the first step. Four inches does not seem like a significant length. Out on the water, it could make the difference between life and death. Just because you may find 12 or 15 inches of ice in one location does not mean that further out you're going to find the same thickness. And so it's important that you test the integrity of the ice uh, before you go out on it. Along with an increase in air temperature, the water current under the ice and snow coverage on top are the biggest factors to cause melting. Just because you were able to go out on it a few days ago or last weekend when you were out fi ice fishing or something like that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to stay the same integrity. For a person, just four inches is needed in order to provide safety. But if you are on a snowmobile, car, or truck, more thickness is needed. Hansen recommends being aware of the Department of Natural Resources postings about the conditions of the ice. I think it's important that when there are things like thin ice warnings out there, that you pay attention to them. There's a reason why they put those signs out there um, on bodies of water. It's important to pay attention to those uh, caution signs. When you're out on the ice, stay alert, because when it comes down to it, your life could be a game of inches. Hansen also recommends always carrying a pole and life jacket with you when you step out on the ice in case someone should fall through. It's so very helpful in order to retrieve someone. Now maybe you caught it uh, in our weather story, the graphic that uh, talked about how thick the ice needs to be, which brings us back to our weather question is how many inches thick should the ice be in order to walk out on it with our answers ranging anywhere from four to 10 inches with the answer at four inches. So if you are a beloved uh, ice fisher or a snowmobiler, Make sure the ice is thick before you go out on it. All right, well, make sure to tread safely. Thank you, Kellen. Thank you. All right. Well, it's time once again to go to sports and Brian Gendro. Thanks, Monty and Ann. There is a nearly endless amount of research that shows the link between high-intensity workouts and the feeling of happiness. One program is turning over delighted participants every hour on the hour. This building constantly endures the buzz of a U.S. highway. Open the door and the buzz is a bit stronger. Everyone can do this. So it started out, it started out as military training. And then as, as the program grew and grew, everyone started seeing that, hey, this program actually works. It's functional movements. It's movements that we perform in everyday life. So why, not, why don't we scale these movements down and make this for everyone? 
The program is called CrossFit, but these participants call it a lifestyle. It's just the way that people work out. You just make it more fun instead of sitting and pushing and pulling on a machine. This isn't your average gym, and this isn't your average Doug. They actually had to put it together, put it back together surgically. They actually had to cut open the side of my leg and, and drive a uh, stainless steel rod through the hip down into the leg and then wrap that. Doug was 20 years old when he was struck by a moving vehicle, breaking both of his legs. Uh, I was in the cast for another two months after I got released from the hospital and then about a year after the accident I, I went back in and had surgery to take the uh, steel rod out of my leg. He has since developed painful arthritis in his knee, but the exercises in the CrossFit program are just the medicine his aching joints need. Man, my knee feels fantastic compared to what it's been for the last two, three years. A CrossFit, CrossFit is going to kill me, and that's not the way it is. It, it's not. We're, we're all about form, technique, getting better every day, and being healthier in life overall. Whatever your age, CrossFit can keep your past from catching up with you or create a healthier future. Outside of its local boxes, CrossFit has developed an international competition called the CrossFit Games. Qualified athletes compete to determine who is the, quote, fittest on earth. Now the answer to this week's Studio One Sports Trivia question, who is the first professional athlete to get paid to endorse a product? Your answer is D, Mr. Wagner. That was in 1905 he endo endorsed the Louisville Slugger. That's a sport. Monty and Ann? Thanks, Brian. USA Today says this year's flu season has been moder moderately severe, but is nearing its end. So far, 59 children have died from influenza. Numbers for adults won't be available until the flu season ends. We wanted your thoughts on whether you choose to get the flu shot. Your answers are still to come. Also, deer hunting enthusiasts may be in for a surprise. We'll show you one man who routinely gets within arm's length of some of the biggest deer in the nation. This scene is familiar, but you and your friends are at risk. One in three Americans will die from heart disease or stroke. Think about it, one in three. Every day, more than 2,000 Americans die from cardiovascular disease. The Million Hearts Initiative works to prevent one million heart attacks and strokes. Understand the risks, get active, and reduce sodium and trans fats in your diet. It's a silent killer, but now is the time to take control of your health. Learn more about making a heart healthy future. At the University of North Dakota College of Engineering and Mines, classes have real-life application. Mentors guide students. Our work improves quality of life by answering tough questions with creativity and innovation. The University of North Dakota College of Engineering and Mines, training tomorrow's engineering and geology experts today. What does cancer look like? What about diabetes, heart disease? Medical laboratory professionals are a vital link in the treatment of disease and maintenance of health. They investigate clues found in the body that will direct patient care. The University of North Dakota's laboratory science programs are some of the most innovative, far-reaching, fully accredited programs in the nation. The UND School of Medicine and Health Sciences can help you become one of the few who see beneath the surface. Most people don't know what it's like to be an entrepreneur. My time clock is around the clock. My ideas are fresh, but they need research and development. My business plan includes marketing strategies, legal documents, and a budget. My startup became possible through mentorship, hands-on experience, and learning from experts in the field. The Center for Innovation has contributed to more than 400 University of North Dakota student startups. Come with an idea. Leave with a business. For some, hunting is one way to enjoy the beauty of nature. One family in a small town in northern Minnesota enjoys the outdoors in a whole new way. Many people enjoy hunting deer. Dylan Porter routinely gets within shooting range as some of the biggest bucks on the continent. Favorite part of the job is watching them grow every year. It's like a uh, Christmas present every day of the summer. Dylan is the second brother of four boys that have helped on his father's farm. 
the whole family is engaged in it. So that's really rewarding. The reward comes from raising something from fawn size to trophy. The hardest part of raising whitetails is probably the bottle feeding if you want to have tame deer. It's very difficult to keep a fawn alive. Dylan, his dad, and his three brothers enjoy educating kids through their deer. We try to encourage students to get outside, spend more time outside instead of on video games and computers. The porters say raising whitetail deer can be a challenge. He will never be loyal to me like a dog. He would never try to protect me, and on any given day he might turn on me and try to kill me. So there's no loyalty, and that's a big difference. The most deer the porters had was about 60 to 75 whitetails on their farm. Life on the farm can be difficult. One time we had a cougar get in our pen and uh, killed a big mature doe, drug it about 50 yards up into some brush and ate part of it and left. Despite all challenges, the porters have a unique tradition of bringing trophy whitetails into the woods. With photographer Alex Stadnick, I'm Amanda Culp reporting for Studio One. Steve says 95% of fawns are born as twins. He adds some can be single, triplets, or even quads. They say as far as they know, they're the only family in the U.S. that travel with live white-tailed deer. Many debate whether or not to get the flu shot. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention say this year's vaccine only reduces the chances of illness by 9% in people over 65. The current vaccine was supposed to be the better match for the main virus. The CDC says it only protected half of the people who got the shot. We wanted your thoughts on whether the flu vaccine is a priority. I figured I'm a pretty young guy and my immune system is at its peak right now. Um, I did. I work at an um, Alzheimer and dementia unit and I didn't want to catch the flu and bring it home to my children. I just forgot, actually. <laughs> did not because of, uh, I don't believe it actually works. Yes, I did. And I get it every year because I don't want to be sick and miss work. Uh, I did not uh, because I am afraid of needles. Yeah, I did. I'm in the Army, so it's required, so I got it. Uh, no, I didn't. I uh, haven't been to the hospital since I was about seven years old. Born and raised farming, so I guess my immune system is pretty good. This year I did because... Uh, the flu was going around and they want to be sick. So, A comment from our Facebook page from Atlanta, Georgia. Jackie says, I'm pretty much immune to the flu, so I don't bother with it. I've only had it once when I was a kid. Josh from California says, it was mandatory for me to get one while in the Army National Guard. Now that I have a choice, I choose against it. So far, I've avoided the flu each year since, too. Terrier from Las Vegas says, no, I did not get a flu shot this or any previous years. There are just too many links to negative side effects that I'm not willing to risk. Still to come, home is much more than simply a place to stay. Next, we'll talk to a man who is documenting how oil workers are trying to make work camps their home. Studio One is a television show produced by students at the University of North Dakota. You can be a part of the graphics team, the marketing team, news team, programming team, production team. Training never ends. You get to produce guests, you get to do the reporting side of it. It's really worth the experience. You will not regret it. This scene is familiar, but you and your friends are at risk. One in three Americans will die from heart disease or stroke. Think about it. One in three. Every day, more than 2,000 Americans die from cardiovascular disease. The Million Hearts Initiative works to prevent one million heart attacks and strokes. Understand the risks, get active, and reduce sodium and trans fats in your diet. It's a silent killer, but now is the time to take control of your health. Learn more about making a heart-healthy future. My doctor tells me to play outside every day. I see a physician assistant in my rural clinic. I'm glad that she's here. But health care is changing. Rural North Dakota communities face workforce shortages, particularly in primary care. The University of North Dakota School of Medicine and Health Sciences addresses the state's health care needs by educating the next generation of health care professionals. We advocate for improved health in rural communities.
It's not the size of the woman in the fight. It's the size of the fight in the woman. The North Dakota oil boom has received national attention. However, the public rarely has exposure to where these workers set up camp. Archaeologist Bill Carhart ventured into the Bakken oil patch to document life within these man camps. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today. You're welcome. Well, to start things off, what was the inspiration behind the North Dakota Man Camp Project? Uh, it's sort of a strange little story that me and a colleague of mine, Brett Weber, in the Department of Social Work, we were working together on the island of Cyprus. I'm a Mediterranean archaeologist, and I was working on Cyprus, uh, documenting a late Roman settlement there. And he and I were sort of talking back and forth about all sorts of interesting directions that our research could go in. And one of them kind of eventually turned to North Dakota. We said, well, why don't we use some of the archaeological methods that we're developing, or we've been using here in the Mediterranean, to document things back home. And uh, he's in the Department of Social Work, and he has social policy interests, and he has interest in housing. Uh, I have sort of experience doing uh, archaeological documentation. We thought, oh, let's try to bring these together and see what's going on in the western part of the state. So how are you kind of cool? Uh Collecting data for this project. Well, we have a kind of a two-prong approach. Actually, we have now a three-prong approach. One is uh, I do a lot of uh, sort of basic documentation of the camps using photography. We have kite cameras that take photography overhead. Uh, we had the uh, airplanes in the aerospace uh, take some aerial photos. Uh, lots of forms that fill out describing the objects that we see in these um, places. And then we also are doing interviews. And uh, over the last uh, two trips out, we've had photographers with us uh, who are more uh, attempting to, to capture things in a more impressionistic way and being less fussy about specific documentation and more interested in kind of capturing the larger picture of what we're doing. So, mm -hmm. so where in the oil patch did you go? Uh, so far we've uh, focused our attention in the areas around Tioga, mm -hmm. in the area, uh, which is just north uh, east of Williston, and the areas around Watford City. And we're going to try to focus closer to mm -hmm. Watford City, uh, the sort of southern part of the Bakken and the Wilson Basin uh, in, in the summer. Mm -hmm. What was li or life like inside the camps? Well, it ranges from things that are like, uh, I don't know, two-star hotels. Uh, the camp that we stay in near Tioga is actually quite nice, quite comfortable, uh, to things that are out of the Grapes of Wrath. Uh, people living in shelter belts, mm -hmm. people, you know, living in tents, uh, you know, even in the winter months living in campers that are, mm -hmm. you know, designed for kind of seasonal living, not for living all year round. And so uh, we don't stay in those places, but we document people who do. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they, they make do. Uh, there are always uh, opportunity costs uh, when engaging in natural resource uh, exploitation like these guys are mm -hmm. doing. And, and so, yeah, they can be, they can be kind of rough. Mm -hmm. Well, popping up here quick, we're going to be having some photos of the certain types of camps. So I was wondering, could you tell me how do you categorize these camps and how does that contribute to your research? Well, because we're archaeologists and social scientists, we're fixated on typology. And so our biggest thing is we wanted to create ways in which we can categorize and group together the different types of uh, things we're seeing. And so our, our fancy... The uh, fanciest camps are type one. These are run by groups like Target Logistics, and they're really like uh, hotels, basically. Uh, the, the less elaborate camps are type two and type three. Type two camps have water, usually have uh, water and electrical hookups. They're masted, like you'd go to an RV park or something. And type three camps are the really rough ones. They're in shelter belts. They tend not to have electrical or water. Um, and so we use these categories to attempt to understand how the different social, how these things produce different social environments as well. Um, ironically, we found that type two and type three camps have often greater sense of community than these uh, places like hotels. But of course, you know, in some ways this makes sense, right? I mean, people don't get a sense of community going to a hotel. Mm -hmm. You know, these are really functional places for living. Whereas these others, uh, people are staying longer, they're uh, doing more to kind of create their own space. Uh, they're interacting more with people. Mm -hmm. uh, they're in their neighbors, so. 
One last question. You had firsthand exposure into a really important time in North Dakota. You know, what do you hope to accomplish through your research? Well, we hope to kind of do three things. Like one is we hope to try to build an archive. Uh, one of the interesting things is past booms don't have a particularly robust archive of what they were like. So we're trying to build an archive so that people in the future can come back and study this. We're also trying to, to collect data that will help policymakers. Mm -hmm. um, this is what a lot of uh, what Professor Weber is doing. And finally, we're trying to, uh, trying to use academic methods to tell the story of what's going on out there. There have been a lot of journalists going out there, a lot of... Uh, cover stories in national magazines, but these okay. people don't have this kind of going back time and time again and attempting to use more scientific methods to to document what's going on. All right. Well, I really hope it gets in the archival record, but thank you so much for being on the show today. You're welcome. You're watching Studio One from the University of North Dakota. We'll be right back after this. Closed captioning for Studio One is underwritten in part by NDAD, helping others to help themselves. It's not the size of the woman in the fight, it's the size of the fight in the woman. The University of North Dakota is a place where students thrive, where they learn from leading experts, share in discoveries and create knowledge. Experience our expertise, creative, innovative, entrepreneurial, spirited. This is the University of North Dakota. Most people don't know what it's like to be an entrepreneur. My time clock is around the clock. My ideas are fresh, but they need research and development. My business plan includes marketing strategies, legal documents, and a budget. My startup became possible through mentorship, hands-on experience, and learning from experts in the field. The Center for Innovation has contributed to more than 400 University of North Dakota student startups. Come with an idea. Leave with a business. Studio One is a television show produced by students at the University of North Dakota. You can be a part of the graphics team, the marketing team, news team, programming team, production team. Training never ends. You get to produce gas, you get to do the reporting side of it. It's really worth the experience. You will not regret it. on Studio One, one trio displays their ethnic roots through, so through soothing music. Plus, we'll have other news and entertainment stories for you. We're going to leave you now with pictures of a fundraising event for the Special Olympics. It had people dressed in costumes jumping into really, really cold water. From all of us here at Studio One, have a great week. <laughs> <laughs>